Ernest Levy was my stepfather. Um, he first came to Scotland in 1961, but it wasn't until 1965 when he returned to Scotland after a short stay in Israel that he came back and married my mother. First few years of our family life, I think, was just that, trying to establish a family life. My brother was born a year after they were married and he started to build up his working relationship with the community in Glasgow, first working in Pollock Shield Synagogue and then working in Gifnock Synagogue in East Renfrewshire. At that time, um, I was growing up. We were just a normal family. I realised that there was something in my parents' background, both my mother and Ernest had gone through a lot during the war, but most of that was somewhere hidden. Um, we were all much more conscious of enjoying our time together and just living a normal life. My father in particular worked very hard with the community in Gifnock. He built a fantastic relationship with all his congregants. They all absolutely adored him both as an individual but also as a cantor. He had a beautiful voice, he had studied music in Hungary and he came here with the idea of being a cantor and trying to make his life in Scotland. I would have first come across Ernest Levy as, as the cantor Levy of Gifnock and Newland Synagogue on the south side of Glasgow, and which I attended with my parents. I started going to, to choir practice and joined the boys' choir. Stayed there for a few years, uh, singing on um, some of the Sabbaths until my voice just got lower and lower and, and, and there was no use of, you know, as a treble or an alto. Once I left the boys' choir, I was, stayed in very close contact with Cantor Levy and um, I became his accompanist. I'm, I'm a, a pianist by profession and we used to go out and play concerts together and entertain with the, with the choral society's guest artists. And in the synagogue, I eventually graduated to being the, the choir master for Ernest. There was a male voice choir for the High Holy Days and, and I would conduct the choir in the synagogue and uh, accompanied Ernest um, many times at the Jewish weddings uh, on the organ and so very much a musical relationship though he was to a certain extent my teacher as well. When I first met him was actually I, was, I, I did not look his story, his life story and you know I wouldn't have and when I was told you know it came to me in bits and pieces about he's a survivor and then about more, a, bit more, a bit more about his story and it was I was amazed that you know this, this person was such a horrible and such a horrific um, life story was able to be such a humorous um, outgoing he was able to reach out to all people and um, you know the community that we have over here uh, it covers all spectrum the whole spectrum of Jewish practice and he was able to reach out to each and one every one of them and it amazed me was the most incredible person. In fact, just last week somebody asked me what was the proudest achievement I had had in my career. And I think I've had a lot of um, wonderful moments, but the, what I actually answered to that was meeting and working with Ernest Levy on the Holocaust project. He was a man completely without bitterness, completely humble. He, he loved everybody he met and Everybody walked away having met Ernest with a good feeling about themselves and the world. What he did do was open my eyes to the Holocaust. Everybody thinks they know about the Holocaust, but listening to the level of detail that Ernest and the personal experiences that he um, enabled me to understand made me really keen that the rest of the world, and certainly Scotland, should know about it and know that Holocausts are, are still continuing across the world. To me, um, Reverend Ernest Levy was the cantor of the synagogue, of the synagogue that I was a member of first. He, it was his voice. 
um, that I heard during the high holidays every year in Shabbat. One of the other ways in which um, I, I was I always contacted and spoke to Ernest was every year for Yom HaShoah and that is the commemorative event in which Jewish communities across the world remember the Jewish victims of the Holocaust and in Glasgow we've always had um, a Yom HaShoah event and Ernest as long as I've ever been involved with it and indeed many many years before has always recited the Kaddish um, the Kaddish is a memorial prayer, but Ernest's uh, memorial prayer was a very personal Kaddish because he didn't just recite it, he kind of lived through it and he knew that as he was reciting it, he was remembering his family, his friends and many of the people he met during his experiences during the Hashoah. And he would also recite all the names of the death camps in Hebrew. He would integrate that into his Kaddish and it was a very, very, very meaningful um, experience to, to listen to it. and it was also a very humbling experience too. My father was very motivated. He was motivated by his work. He loved the work that he did in the synagogue. He was also motivated by music. He was a member of choirs. He had a choir within the synagogue with some young, um, young boys. Uh, but first and foremost though, I think he was also a people person. He showed great empathy towards people who were in difficulties or were going through a difficult time. Ernest was never the kind of person who would ever turn anybody away. Um, if there was any chance of him helping somebody, helping an individual, helping a family, he would never turn them away regardless of their faith or their colour or their background. Um, he believed in the goodness of humanity and I think he wanted to see himself as a good human being, which I think he was. Paris was certainly um, a, a great friend and, and a great favourite amongst the, certainly the, uh, the, the West Coast, the, the, the Glaswegian Jewish community. He was, he was, he was always up for uh, entertaining. He would go to the old age homes and, and, and sing to the residents there. Many, many parties in, in the synagogue. Certainly, it was a great favourite at Hanukkah time uh, in December each year where Gifnick Synagogue would hold a community party and we would put together little, little musical evenings. One famous um, image was that Ernest did a little act dressed brilliantly as Charlie Chaplin with the with the bowler hat and the cane and, uh, and, and, and he, he absolutely perfected the walk and certainly a great favourite as, as an entertainer but uh, also, also hugely respected in, in leading the synagogue services and, as I've said earlier an, 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 an expert on the on the liturgy and the and the musical connection with that so very very prominent figure in the music in the Glasgow community. Ernest was a very level-headed guy you know he had a great sense of humor and you know when he saw things people do things you know in a community of all different types of people and he would comment when a certain you know when someone would say something and do something and he would laugh when it needed to be laughed, and he would also, if, he, if something, something had to be said, it, he said it in a very beautiful way, but he said it in his heyday as cantor to the community. And the heyday of the community itself, we had many, we had much more numbers. Ernest used to have a choir of children. Children, I think some teenagers as well. And I think each and every one, you meet them today, they, they can't, they just, they speak about Ernest with, with, with awe. And, and just, and, and I think that's an amazing influence to have. And all, and these, these young, you know, these men had gone off to do, to all over the world. And you know, some of them remained very committed to Judaism. Others just, you know, drifted and went, did doing their own things. But you, talk, you mentioned Ernest. They are, they just sort of, they sort of stand up, in in, in, with, in respect. I think he's had the greatest influence of any man I've ever known, not only in the Jewish community, but much, much wider. And he did a huge amount of work with other interfaith organisations. 
and I think anybody that met Ernest was touched by touched by the man. I think he had something quite magical. Even young people, he had a wonderful way with young people in telling them his story as well, but taking the some of the, the worst aspects out, out of it. But after meeting Ernest, young people were equally amazed at what he'd done and how he'd survived. And often young people would start from a position of not knowing what the Holocaust was at all, and Ernest brought that to life for them. So I think anybody who's ever met Ernest, all of these young people will have something fro taken from those meetings with Ernest that would live with them throughout their lives. I don't think you could talk to Ernest without being influenced by him because he, I mean, he would actually probably say, don't be influenced by me if you, if you was you know, sitting talking to him just now. But, but you did, you were influenced by him because he, he did have such total faith in, in, in humanity, not, not in, a, in a superficial way, in a very genuine way. He knew, he knew man, he knew mankind, warts and all. Um, but he genuinely, he could see that you could overcome things and you could just get on with life and enjoy life for what it is um, and have that connection with God. I mean, that, he was, as you know, he was an observant Jew. But uh, I think it was his his understanding of mankind. And as I call mankind, I mean people from all walks of life, uh, from all different faiths, from all different social classes, from from those who are the most honest and sincere people to those who are the dishonest people in our community. You know, he, he had time for everybody. I think one of the messages that Ernest, that I always heard from Ernest, was first of all, th there is hope. You, you know, you can suffer the worst things in life. And he, he actually, he lived with, he suffered for the whole life. His health suffered because of his Holocaust experience. But he, but he had hope, there is hope. The world is a good place. He wasn't a pacifist, pacifist. he did believe that there is, you know, there's still evil in the world, but he's also believed that there's good people in the world. And we have to recognize that, and we have to, you know, that, and, and, and we have to believe that the goodness of people will always come shining through. I certainly always remember when we were attending choir practices with the boys' choir, we would spend only half the time singing, and Ernest would spend half the rest of the time talking to us about some of his experiences and, and, uh, instilling in all of us, even from that early age, great stories about, about uh, mankind and about tolerance and, and, and how we, even through the terrible times in the war, there were, there were still, there was a, still there was a special light in every person and there's there good in each and every one of us. Ernest's legacy, I think, in, is throughout Scotland. I think there's MPs, councillors, famous people throughout the UK and worldwide that will remember Ernest and his work. Um, this archive that has been given to us by the family will, will keep that memory alive. And I'm very proud to say that, that I'm glad that it's come to Edinburgh because they know, the family know, that we will use it and make it work as a lasting legacy for Ernest. I also hope that once people see the archive, they will also have some kind of idea of the diverse skills that he had as a writer, as an actor, as a singer. Um, he also had a tremendous sense of humour and there may be little anecdotes that people will give to show what a humorous and wonderful person he really was.